Welcome to our new video series, Speed Data, Quick Conversations with Cybersecurity Leaders. I'm your host, Megan Garza, and today I'm joined by Director of Data Governance and Privacy at Optiv Inc., Jordan McClinic. Welcome, Jordan. Thank you, Megan. Nice to be here. Jordan runs Optiv's advisory services group within their data governance privacy practice and specializes in assisting organizations align their compliance obligations with business objectives. Before he joined Optiv, Jordan worked as the advisory senior manager at PwC and as the privacy manager for the general counsel office at Western Union. Now, Jordan, you have a unique background of a blend of helping customers build data governance programs, policies, and controls, which works nicely with your legal expertise. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that that comes in more than handy when it comes to helping organizations ensure compliance. Now, you have your law degree. How does that help you in your current role at Optiv? Great question, Megan. And you know, I think if you were to ask me when I was in law school, would you end up in the cybersecurity space? I probably would have laughed and had no idea what you're <laughs> talking about. Uh, however, uh, you know, there's been a, over the last few years, especially in the privacy state space, there's so many regulations rolling out. And one of the things that we see a lot of, especially in the consulting world, is, you know, often clients will have a legal team and they can really interpret the regulations and say, you know, this is what the regulation says we need to do. But then you also have the operational team and the operational team's great at operations, but doesn't always know how to take those legal requirements and turn them into operational controls. As for something like, you know, having my legal background to be able to interpret those regulations, but also, you know, what I do on a day-to-day basis is do the operational components really allows me to kind of help articulate for clients, individuals, and even internally adoptives, what are the legal requirements? And then how do we operationalize? I think that's a big gap that we see in the industry. And I know there's been a lot of trends, especially here recently, we're seeing more and more legal folks starting to get into cybersecurity. And I do feel like it's to bridge that gap from legal requirements to operational impact. And what does that look like for an organization? And in addition to your legal acumen, I know you've also written important articles, such as one that I recently read, Why Does Data Privacy Matter? Are you a bit of a writer? I enjoy writing. Uh, I found out early in my career, I was not the best at legal writing, which is very dry. Um, I try to make it more conversational. And uh, I, I do like to write articles, get stuff out there, especially in the space, because there's a lot of new stuff coming out. Well, yeah. Often people just want a little thought leadership on, you know, what does this look like across the industry? So I do enjoy writing. Not the best at it, but I try my best. I will agree to disagree on that one. Uh, can you summarize for our audience why does data privacy matter? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, one of the big things um, I often hear from clients say, you know, we've had so many incidents and we know from a consumer standpoint, a lot of our data is already out there and why does it matter? And while that is relevant and true, that's that's kind of more reactive and looking kind of at what's happened in the past. What we really like to work with clients on in particular from a consumer standpoint and consumer sentiment, but also for internal operations within organizations, really three big themes, right? And that's transparency, choice, and control. And for Privacy Week, our uh, Privacy Week this year, the big thing was respect. And that was something that we actually launched in our offerings uh, of really the concept of respect two years ago. So it was kind of a nice little theme to see respect pull through. And so what that article really hit on is when we talk about respecting personal data, consumers, employees, our B2B context, there's three three big themes, right? And the, the first one being transparency and really just putting the task on organizations to be very transparent with individuals on, you know, what are we collecting from? You? How are we using that? Where are we sending your personal data? Because that's often a purview that as a consumer, I personally know, I don't always know, right? And there's a lot of convenience that we'll give up in our day-to-day life, especially in the digital era, that you know, providing our data provides a lot of ease and simplicity in our life. But we often, you know, how, how are you using it? Where are you selling? Are you selling it? Are you sharing it with other organizations? And I might not object to it. I just want to know and be informed with how my data is being used. Um, and then from that, really, it stems into control and choice, right? It, for the ability to what you shared with me and how you're using my data, I like to have some choice around. Maybe I'm okay with you using it, but I really don't want you sharing it with other organizations. And being able to provide the options for me to make a little more informed decisions on how my data is being used, crucial aspect, and that really plays into control, right? Giving me as the consumer or as an employee a better ability to control how my data is being used, especially since we know that data has money associated with it. And I would like to have some control and aspect and purview 
into how that data is being used across other organizations. Yeah. And I like what you said about the thought that, oh, well, all my data is already out there. What does it matter? But it really is about respect and, and your, the consumer having the ability to have an input and say so on what their data is shared and how their data is used and, and who's sharing it and how is it being shared. So I, I like what you said there. Yeah. And just, you know, one other thing too on that, we're seeing a lot, and there's a bunch of reports out of statistics around, you know, customer attrition rates. And we are seeing, there's, I think it's around 70, 75% now of consumers are saying we will not do business with certain organizations based on poor data practices and poor data management. So as we continue to digitize our lives, we see that as being a more and more theme of concern for consumers and really putting that concept of respect within organizations really goes along with holding your, your, your customers, right? keeping them engaged and then uh, providing that data to you. Right. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't want to do business with a company that I felt like had poor data practices. So that makes sense. You mentioned a little bit your your day to day. What does a typical day look like for you? Uh, very, uh, very good question. It can vary wildly, but um, you know, if I was to kind of paint broad brush strokes, we have three big areas I, I work on and help both internally for Optiv, but also with our client base. And a lot of what I really like to do um, is getting out with clients, really in that kind of pre engagement model, right? meeting with clients, talking through what are your pain points. So what are we trying to accomplish? What does in state and good look like for you? Because one of the big things with clients is not everyone needs the Cadillac option, right? Sometimes and often it's let's get something that's a point of defensibility, uh, right? And so if the regulators start asking, you know, what can we articulate as this is our path. This is our journey. This is our current state of how we do these both privacy and data governance requirements. And so I really enjoy getting on phone calls with clients and talking about what are your pain points and how, how, what does good look like for you? And that really leads into, you know, after we kind of had those discussions, a large piece of what I also am hands-on involved with is delivery, right? Making sure the North star that we define as what is good. Uh, in those so scoping calls, make sure we're still marching towards it, right? Things will change along the ways, but uh, a lot of what I do is really staying embedded and engaged with our clients and making sure that we keep the end state objective in mind while we're building out a larger program. Yeah. And then finally, the third piece, I do a lot, I love to do a lot of thought leadership. The blog post you mentioned earlier is a, a piece my team and I pull a lot of content together because this is not a well-known space. Um, and there's a lot of clients that just need a little direction on, you know, what are we seeing? What are we seeing other organizations do? What are we doing internally for our own uh, teams and benefits? And that is a big piece of just really being able to articulate, help people, whether it's through white papers or blog posts, um, just trying to shape the larger picture of the evolving landscape. Sure. And what do you find to be most challenging about determining which path or route to recommend to customers are looking to build out their data governance programs based on those pain points you mentioned? Yeah, that's a, a great question. You know, I think the biggest piece and challenge is often when we want to stand up a program, uh, especially if we're bringing in technology and enhancing process, we can get a long ways down the path of defining what does good look like from a program standpoint. But one of the things we work a lot with across our organization with clients is What's your data strategy? What are we actually trying to accomplish? You know, we can talk about what regulations are in scope for you, what requirements you need to have in place, but really, you know, getting an idea of, are you looking for moving to a first party data model? Because that's going to have different programmatic requirements or trying to monetize data. Additional, additional protections to be put in place around secondary and tertiary data use. So that is a big piece of what is the organization's strategy as it relates to data, because that's really going to inform from a tooling standpoint, from a program standpoint, from a people standpoint, what do we need to have in place to ensure we are being compliant and keeping our consumers and our personal data top of mind on these new initiatives and journeys? I always like to chat with my guests about life outside of work too. And so I'm curious, if you weren't in cybersecurity, what would you be doing? Great question. Um, if I wasn't in cybersecurity, I think what I would really love to do uh, is farming. Um, you, if you recall, and in junior or in elementary school, we always had the surveys. It's kind of like, hey, what are you going to do with your life? I, I always was, you know, forestry, farming, something outdoors. And I really think that the thing I like about farming is, you know, you put a lot of effort in. You don't see a tangible benefit immediately. Uh, you know tilling the soil, getting the seeds planted, doing the care and feeding. And then months later, you have some fruits and vegetables to reap from your harvest and your hard work. And 
I think that that mindset applies to cybersecurity as well, right? We don't often see immediate success. It's more making sure that the field is fertile, making sure that we get the right seeds in the ground. We have the right water to grow and output at a later date. That's beneficial, right? It provides us sustenance. And I think while the theme is the same, if I wasn't doing cybersecurity, I would still apply that theme to farming. I love that analogy. That's fantastic. I actually, I just had my backyard sodded. And so I'm out there multiple times a day, watering it, taking oh, care yeah. of it, nurturing it in hopes that it will continue to grow. That's um, completely right. Lastly, before we go, uh, can you share with me, what is the one thing you wish future cybersecurity professionals knew? Oh, um, I'm going to steal a quote that my wife uses with me frequently. And it is, uh, we're looking for progress, not perfection. And I think in this space, we often uh, have paralysis by analysis. Well, you know, one of the things that I pitch and talk with clients on is they want to know every aspect and detail that's going to go into designing a program. And that's not always the case. Sometimes we can get very close to find what we need, but things change. And so my biggest thing I think I'd recommend is to keep in mind, and I wish that everyone did, would take the moral concept of this, just make progress, right? And that progress will lead to more progress. And while perfection is the end state that we want to get to, there's a journey to get there. And trying to have everything defined up front is usually going to be pretty hard, if not impossible. So getting some progress started and being able to identify new problems as they arise will get us down that path of progression. And then we can start looking at, you know, what do we need to enhance and mature? It might be not be perfect, but be very defensive. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jordan. I enjoy learning more about the data governance side of cybersecurity and why data privacy is so important. Uh, as always, if our audience has any questions you'd like to see asked during our next Speed Data episode, please email me at mgarza at Thanks again, Jordan. Thank you. Appreciate the time. <laughs>